thank you all for registering. We had about a hundred and something register, I think, for this. Uh, and then with the Zoom issues and with the with campus Wi-Fi being what it is, uh, we're expecting maybe some more people will come through over the next little while. Uh, today's session is around about an hour and a half. Um, and we're going to be talking specifically about uh, chatbots and then uh, even more specifically, chatbots in teaching and learning. I am coming from uh, from UBC Vancouver today, which is located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. There is a worksheet which you can follow along. Uh, there is a QR code there, or hopefully someone can just pop this in the chat for me and you can all follow along. I think we sent most people uh, who received the, uh, the, the reminder email, we sent you a link to a chat bot, uh, which we have created specifically for this session on Po. Hopefully, for those people that did receive the email too, we asked you to sign up for an account on po.com. So uh, poe.com. Uh, if you don't have one, please, by all means, go and uh, go, go and grab one now. Uh, if, if you don't feel comfortable creating an account on Pogon, that's, that's fine. Later on today, we'll actually be putting you into breakout rooms with sort of three or four uh, of you. And hopefully at least one of you will have uh, an account on po.com by that point. Um, so you can sort of get carrying along with the activity. So that's the worksheet for today. And we're going to jump straight in to talk essentially about definitions, because I don't know how some of you folks feel, but if you've been around the Gen AI space for the last sort of 12, 15 months, you'll have seen a lot of words and terms that seem really familiar. Like you, you've seen some of these words and you're like, well, why is my own language being co-opted? Uh, why, why is now why is now something mean? something else entirely different what, what's happening um and it's actually why we wrote a glossary of terms on our website which uh is proving fairly popular um and we've written i think 20 or so different terms uh, one of which is agents and one of which further down here is chatbots both of which we'll actually be talking about today in detail so i'm going to start with a definition because I think in this space at the moment, actually making sure we're all, we all know what we're talking about is actually really quite important. Um, so the two specific things we're gonna be talking about are chatbots or Gen AI chatbots and agents. So a chatbot is probably something that you have used or at least seen many times over the last, uh, at least in the last 12 months, but probably over the last, uh, the last number of years. Um, we're going to be talking specifically today about Gen AI chatbots, which have only really become a thing since the advent of Gen AI around about 16 to 18 months ago. And then we're going to be talking about agents. So let's first, let's get on to what chatbots are to start with. Chatbots have existed since the 60s, uh, which might sound a bit strange, uh, considering they've only really been here for um it's sort of at least front and center for the last 18 months um and the first one was called eliza who uh was made at mit in 1966 and it was actually a, a psychotherapist scripted response bot so what that means is the bot was looking for very specific phrases in something that you might that a user might uh, might type uh, and then would reply in a very scripted way based on those those responses uh, and things evolved over the next sort of decade-ish uh, through Parry and Jabberwacky and Dr. Spazzo and Alice. Um, and they were all actually along the lines of mental health work. Uh, I don't really know what sort of drove that, but um, Parry and Jabberwacky and Dr. Spazzo were all basically focused on um, talking specifically about mental health. And I think it might be because some of the language used for these things uh, is uh, very prescriptive, as in it could be literally coded for uh, with specific responses and specific things to look for, specific words at least to look for. Uh, and then again, as time went on, uh, we're going through the 90s now and in the early aughts, we eventually got to sort of 2010 when Siri was developed by Apple. Uh, and it became the first widely adopted personal assistant, but it could use natural language both for receiving and for giving out. So it could actually understand natural language and it could respond in something that 
was at least pseudo natural language. And if any of you have used Siri over the last 14 years, you'll probably be just as frustrated as you were 14 years ago with it. But we're told everything's going to be better later this year. So we'll see. Um, and then a little bit later, uh, so seven years later, actually, in 2017, things changed. And uh, we got to uh, what I think is a seminal paper by uh, folks at DeepMind. And the paper was titled Attention is All You Need. And I think going forward in, in a few years time, maybe, maybe I don't know, uh, half a decade, a decade, I think this particular research paper will be, uh, I genuinely believe, will be uh, a turning point in terms of um, where we where we see not just chatbots, but I think where portions of society are going to change. And I think it actually comes from this paper. This paper changed everything when it comes to machine learning and certainly when it comes to generative AI and chatbots. I highly encourage you to give it a read, actually. It's a, it's a remarkably readable paper um, for something that is so deep and so complex. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is well, well, worth, well worth the read. Um, so that is kind of... The, the history of chatbots, but it doesn't really define them. What, what are chatbots? Chatbots really are where you as a human can type and you expect a response, a helpful, useful response. Normally, traditionally, actually prior to 18 months ago, you would get a very fixed answer. So it would be looking for certain keywords that you would type in and you would get a very scripted response. Since the advent of generative AI, those responses have become more human-like. Uh, and that is the goal of generative AI, to create human-like content, whether it be text in the form of chatbots or images or video or audio. But it's all something that is at least human-like uh, in content. And generative AI has really helped both the understanding of natural language, as in natural language processing, in terms of being able to listen or understand, I'm um, using very much inverted commas when I say that, uh, the, the words that you are using uh, when you're asking questions or making statements, and then also in the responses. So you're able to have more deep, meaningful conversations with these chatbots now because of the deep-rooted, again, understanding of natural language. So that's what we're going to say as a chatbot. A chatbot is something that you can talk to uh, normally via text. You can't there. Some of them you can actually uh, speak to now audibly and get a response either in text or, or audio. Um, but that's what we're going to define as a, a Gen AI chatbot. It's going to be something that you can speak to in natural language and expect to receive a response in natural language. The difference, the primary difference between a chatbot that you'll have seen sort of over the last 10 years and something that is uh, that is happening right now is underneath there is a there is a large language model. Those large language models basically allow us allow us to actually have a half decent understanding uh, of the language itself, and it can interpret very specific phrases or parts of text and actually output real language that a human might use. Agents, which is the second part of this uh, talk today, are slightly different in terms of an agent you can think of as a chatbot, but it is a very focused chatbot that has a very specific skill set. Um, agents can be deployed standalone. So what that means is they can be deployed on their own, uh, just like a regular chatbot would be. And that, that, that chatbot in that regard will be very good at one specific thing, but they're much more useful when they're allowed to communicate with each other and are given a task as a whole that they can autonomously accomplish. So it goes from taking a single chatbot and you having a conversation with that chatbot back and forth to having several chatbots, which you give a goal or a task to, and they communicate with each other and then spit something out, whether that be, uh, well, it could be anything, essentially. And we'll see a few demonstrations later of what those might be. But it all happens autonomously without your without your um, input during the process, unless you want to, in which case you can actually have some input in the process, but you give it a task and each one of those independent agents, which are given a specific goal, as in they are specifically good at one thing, they communicate with each other and produce something. Okay, great. So I, I'm back. Um, 
And I just want to quickly introduce myself and then I'm going to jump in. So I'm Lucas Wright. I'm a senior educational consultant at the CTLT. And I've been working around generative AI for about the last year and a half. And I think I'm hoping to share some of the knowledge I've gained from research as well as from doing a lot of workshops around this area. And I think through those workshops, it's such a privilege to get to learn from other folks. So let's talk a little bit about chatbots. And I'm going to go through this stuff with you for about the next 15 minutes, and then we have some interactions. And today, what we're talking about is the idea of customized chatbots, as Rich has eloquently introduced. And so in a few minutes, I'll share some examples of customized chatbots. But the idea of these chatbots that we can customize with our own data and with our own prompts right away offers some interesting opportunities. Um, the way that we've been starting to see these chatbots are being used as homework and study assistance. I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute. Personalized learning tools. So we can really start personalizing the learning that students do beyond the large language models. So beyond what ChatGPT can do, we can start personalizing with our own content, with our own course content. Skill development tools, I'm gonna to demo one of those in a few minutes, but again, these ideas that we can help customize students' experience, learning specific skills. Uh, virtual teaching assistants. So I think this does bring up some interesting equity issues, but the idea of tuning and creating chatbots that can be used in a course as a teaching assistant course assistants almost acting like a syllabus assistant so they can help guide students through the specific courses and as i'll demo in a little bit an advising chatbot so chatbots that can advise students about enrollment in the case of the example i'll share science advising chatbot and i wanted to share this quote from the Microsoft Future of Work report. So I've linked this in the document that I've shared with you. But I, I find this really fascinating is that, you know, as we're thinking about all the efficient things that chatbots can help us with, I think there's also a larger movement going on. And I really like how Microsoft's put this, the digital knowledge is starting to move from document to dialogues. So knowledge is no longer just embedded in spreadsheets and text. We're thinking about what knowledge looks like when it's embedded in conversation. So, you know, as you think of your teaching or your design practice, I think it's worth thinking in the near term how it can change how we design a course, how it can change how we teach, but also thinking in the far term, how is it going to change the whole idea of a course and the whole idea of what teaching might be? Some value of custom chatbots, um, we can customize them for specific teaching contexts and for specific domains. I think one of the challenges we're running into now with using ChatGPT, using Bing AI, is it's really hard to define the content that students are getting. Sometimes they're getting answers out of context. We can incorporate validated data. We know that these models hallucinate. We know that the data they share isn't always the data we want. We can think about creating chatbots now that can share very specific data. We can also use them as a way to reduce bias. Again, um, go into chat GPT, search typical Canadian family and ask for a screenshot. And you're going to right away see the bias that pulls up in these tools. How can we use custom chatbots to tune them ourselves and reduce some of that bias? And kind of that larger piece is how can we personalize teaching and learning? But um, I think more than anything I've ever talked about or any workshops I've ever done is the ethical issues and limitations with generative AI are so big that it's a very big, it's very difficult to reconcile these. And I want to talk about a couple specific issues and limitations that we're running into with custom chatbots. One is when we start thinking about building a chatbot that can be used by our students without supervision, we run into the issue of hallucinations and thinking about responsibility. And there's a term for these uh, generative AI, they're 100% accurate, but maybe 70 or 80% confident. And this creates some really challenging issues. Air Canada ran into this recently. I don't think they were using generative AI for this chatbot. It was a more traditional chatbot. 
but they were have found legally liable for the advice that the chatbot gave a customer. Um, and this this was uh, there was a court case around this. So we know these tools hallucinate. They we know they don't always provide correct advice, and we are responsible for this. So what does this mean in the academic context? Context. We know that students, if they're using it as a tutoring tool, getting incorrect answers may affect their academic performance. And how do we think around this? If they're using it for application processes, a custom chatbot that gives them the wrong information may make the difference between them being accepted or not. And how do we deal with responsibility around this? And if they're using a chatbot for career guidance, what if they're misguided in their career? And again, how can we work with them to help reduce those issues? Also help prepare students, perhaps that there may be issues when we create them. And just overall, how do we deal with that responsibility? Number two is similar to generative AI, which these tools are quite leaky right now in terms of privacy, yet we know that there's lots of institutional data going into these tools. And recently with ChatGPT, I don't know if anyone saw this um, hack that happened, is someone asked ChatGPT to repeat the word poem forever which I find totally fascinating that this worked. Instead of writing the word poem forever, it started releasing personal information from its database. So similar to how the large generative models are leaky, we also know that the chat bots, the custom chat box, say GPTs, also have been leaky. And researchers have been able to find out the data that they were being fed find out the prompts that there were that were used to create them just by using front end commands so kind of two levels of privacy one these chatbots do leverage large language models we know that they're leaky and secondly the chatbots themselves have privacy implications the third example is a little bit more future facing but it's the idea of ghost students and this is happening in the admissions area quite a bit now in the states where we're having bots go through the admission process to receive um, awards, et cetera. We know that this happens now with Taylor Swift tickets where bots are flooding Ticketmaster and buying up all the Taylor Swift tickets. But what does it mean when a bot might be able to enroll in a university course past the course, um, completely uh, online course, without people realizing it's a bot? And how do we deal with this sort of challenge? You know, there are other issues to talk about, such as bias within these tools, but I think it's worth keeping these issues in mind as we go through. And I now wanna share a couple examples with you of what these custom bots look like, and then we'll do an activity around that where you get to try a couple of the examples. So the first bot I wanted to share with you is a customized bot made by Tony Bates. Could I get a thumbs up in the using your reactions if you've heard of Tony Bates or read any of Tony Bates's work? Just give everyone a second to do that. Great, so we have one or two folks have. Wonderful. So Tony used to be the uh, run the distance and learning program at UBC. And kind of to experiment with bots, Tony created his own Tony bot. And he used his website to tune this bot and to train it so that it calls on the data from the website. I think this is an example, I'll get you to play with it in a moment, of what these bots can be. So I'm just sharing the Tony bot and I'm going to say, is it okay? Or should a faculty member do course design with a team? And if you know Tony Bates's work, he really believes in using teams to develop courses rather than having individual faculty do it. And let's see what we get from here. 
Yeah, so he does say that we should start working on a team because by using a team, it's going to give us his benefits. And if you've read his blog, you'll know that this is important for Tony not to have kind of a lone ranger approach to course design, but allow a team to do that for him. The next example of a chatbot I wanted to share with you is called AI Tutor Pro. And this was developed by Contact North, which is a a governmental organization in Ontario that works around teaching and learning. And the goal of this bot is to help around learning new topics. So their example here is safe driving. So I'm going to keep using this topic. And if I click safe driving, you'll see I can do this in at a different level. So professional, high school, or elementary level. Let's try it for professional level, and I can also decide on the response language. So what it's going to start doing now is it's going to start quizzing me on my skills about driving. So when you're driving, you want to overtake the car in front of you. Which mirror should you check first before you start to pass? And what should you do after checking the mirror? I'm going to say side view. My side view mirror is broken right now, so I don't know if that applies, but let's give that a try. And it's going to give me an answer. So now we're getting into this idea of a custom bot that can be used for tutoring. And when we think of uh, teaching and learning and education, if you have a chance to read Bloom's Six Sigma problem, which is a 90, a paper he wrote in the 1980s that compares classroom teaching to tutoring, um, we know that tutoring tends to be a more efficient way of learning. So what does it mean to be able to create scalable tutoring bots that are customized to our particular situation? So I'll give you a couple more examples, and then I'll give you a chance to play with these bots as well. Um, the idea of a tutoring chatbot, I think this is one of the most powerful examples. Although we can do, use tools like ChatGPT for tutoring, it takes a fair bit of prompting. So by building a custom chatbot, we can have more specific answers. This screenshot is from Conmingo. It's not available in, the, in Canada yet, but it's available in the US. And what that is, is it's a Khan Academy tutor that allows students to get tutoring on different math subjects as well. It's been customized, I think, using ChatGPT in the back end, but it allows for a tutoring experience. The second example I wanted to share, you, share with you is out of Stanford. This is a virtual course assistant chatbot in Canvas. And what they've done for this chatbot is they've fed it with the course syllabus and with course information. So rather than students relying on the syllabus now, they're able to query the chatbot to get specific information about the course. The third example is from the UBC KIC project. KIC is a, pro is a partnership between Amazon and UBC, and this is a science advising chatbot. And if you take a look at the screen here, you'll see that it's able, it's been trained with specific data around the science program at UBC, and students are able to get information about specializations, about programs, and about approaches by querying the bot. And what's interesting about this bot is it's dealt with privacy quite a bit by using the Amazon cloud. So we're not sharing it into um, chat GPT, et cetera. And it's also been specifically trained with data in this area rather than giving generic answers. So that's a couple examples. And what I'd like you to do now is if you can go to the worksheet and take a look at activity one called try a chatbot. I've put a link to the Tony Bates chatbot. Ask the Tony chatbot about anything about online learning. You might even ask some personal information about Tony, see what happens. And also try the AI tutor chatbot just to get a feeling for it. So I'm gonna give you about four minutes to give those chatbots a try. And once you do that, I'd like folks to share what this could mean for teaching, what it could mean for course design. And um, what I want to look at now with you is GPTs. 
And GPTs are a type of custom bot that we can create using chat GPT. I think one of the challenges here, and I didn't talk about this before, is it does start bringing equity issues into play because GPTs are a play to pay, uh, sorry, pay to play. Um, I pay 20 Canadian a month, or sorry, 20 American a month to use them. Um, and so not all of our students will have access to them. They're also not open, so I can't just share a GPT with you so that you can use it. So I'll demo a couple of these, and then we're going to move on to the Po platform and then have you use that to develop a bot. So GPTs are ways, a custom versions of ChatGPT and Dolly that use the large language model that OpenAI created, but you can also customize the prompts that they're created with, as well as add documents or websites to them so that they can use that information in their responses. So I'm gonna demo a couple of them. Um, a couple I wanted to highlight for you, one is TutorMe, which is created by the Khan Academy again. And it's kind of a mini version of ConMingo, which has been set up for tutoring. The other one is Scholar GPT, which is fed with scholarly research. So it's able to answer questions based on scholarship rather than the current GPT model only. So I'm just going to demo a couple for you, but could I get a thumbs up if you've used different GPTs in the past? Let me just kind of get a show of thumbs here. Great. So I see Leah has, looks like a couple folks have. And can I also get a thumbs up if you've created one before? Okay. I don't see too many there yet. Um, so just a couple I wanted to kind of bring to your attention. Yeah, Flynn, Flynn gave us a thumbs up as well. What's nice about the GPTs and what I've noticed recently is they've really expanded in terms of the offerings that they have. So a couple that I'll mention to you, this is TutorMe. And if I want to start on a, a GPT, I can just open it like this. And I'm going to give it, ask for 10 practice problems. What subject would I like to practice? Let's say calculus. It's probably going to ask me for a level. <clears throat> and again, this is going to be customized by Khan Academy. Stalling for me a little bit here. We'll see if it goes or if we just need to move on. I'll, I'll give it another few seconds and then we can just jump on to another GPT. All right, let's just keep going on to other ones here now. That didn't seem to work for us. One moment. Great. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so another couple that I wanted to mention to you is <clears throat> Wolfram Alpha. And I think this is an important one to understand how to use, but also that it is there if we're thinking about academic integrity and in our students and what they can produce. Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha is a computational engine. And one of the challenges of ChatGPT is that it can have real weak spots around math, around graphing, et cetera. But by using Wolfram Alpha, it's going to be calling on this computational database to get its answers. So I'm going to have it plot this particular intersection, and you'll see it can write in, I'm not sure if it's LaTeX or MathML, um, and it can also call on Wolfram now, and it can plot different coordinates, solve computational questions, etc. So now it's going to create a plot for me, and I can link to that on Wolfram. So again, these GPTs allow it to have much more complex functionality that link to other tools. Just to demo another one, I wanted to create one. I made this one just for fun, thinking about what a GPT would mean if it was just for an individual assignment. So this is an Uber, urban design tutor. And I'll say, tell me about 
a complete street. And I prompted this chatbot to think about Vancouver approaches to urban design, especially ones talked about by Larry Beasley, who was the city planner for Vancouver. And we'll see if that's going to work for us today. So now it's going to tell me about a complete street and it's gonna tell me what it looks like. It's gonna ask me a question because I actually had that within the prompt. So again, GPTs can be customized based on data. They can also be customized based on prompts. The next thing I wanna move on to is to Poe. And I wanna move on to this to start setting us up for our next activity where you are going to be able to create a chatbot. So the Poe platform is a little bit more of an open platform that allows you to create chatbots that anyone can access as long as they've logged into Poe. So it doesn't, it's not a pay to, pay to play. They can just log into Poe and use these. And I'll just demo a couple that I created, and then I'll kind of show you the back end of these. So the first one that I designed was called a course design bot. And the prompt that I used for this called on the research of DFINK to create um, backward design tables, as well as called on learning objectives. I've also asked it to start by asking me what the course topic is. So I'm gonna say introduction biology. And we'll see if it goes through here. Let's try that one more time. I'm having some bad luck. Let's try my learning support bot. So I'm a learning strategy tutor. Ask me or tell me about an issue or challenge you're having with your studying or learning, and I will advise you how to improve. I'm gonna say concentration. And I've asked it now to ask me questions one at a time. What are your challenges? I'm gonna say staying focused. And after I answer this, it should give me some research-based strategies around staying focused. So again, I'll show you in a second what this looks like in the back end, but the goal of this bot was to provide some specific information about learning support. And let me just show you the prompt for this bot. And this is gonna show you how to build them in a second. So you'll see the handle for the bot is a learning support bot. The base bot with Poe, what's really interesting about Poe is you can choose different base bots. So I've chose ChatGPT for this one, but I could have chose Claude. I could have chose Gemini, Gemini for this one, Llama, um, Stable Diffusion, Image Generators, et cetera. So I can choose one base bot. Then I can generate a prompt for this bot. And when you're thinking about creating these bots, it's a good chance to work on your prompting skills. So for this bot for my prompt, I said, you are a learning support expert at the University of British Columbia. By using that term, the persona, you are a support expert, I helped it call on more effective data. So by using a specific persona, it generally calls on better data with more than 30 years of experience. Whenever you are prompted or asked a question, ask questions about the prompt to better understand the needs and goals of the prompt. So I've kind of created some interaction within the tool. Ask the questions one by one. And if you've prompted ChatGPT very often, if you've created these prompts for bots, what they like to do is give you all the questions at the same time. And it completely wrecks the one-on-one -on -one interaction. So I'm asking it to ask it one at a time. When you have a good understanding of the issue, 
provide a five-point learning strategy. The strategy should be evidence-based and incorporate recent understandings of learning science, as well as student development literature and student habits, include specific examples and concrete techniques that will improve learning, studying, and metacognition. And then at the very end, I put again, start with the first question, because again, it has this, these, these models tend to give you all the questions at once. Scrolling down a little bit, you'll see that I could add a knowledge source. For the bot that I shared with you, I uploaded uh, a document that had all of the information on the worksheet. I could also link to a specific site there. I put a greeting message in there. So I'm a learning strategy tutor. Ask me or tell me about an issue or challenge you're having with your learning or studying and I will advise you on how to improve. So that's the first message the users are gonna see. The bot profile here, and then I made it public accessible. From there, I create the bot, and then the bot is available like this, and you can share it here as a link. So in a moment, I'm gonna put you into groups, and we're gonna do groups of four. And what I would like you to do in these groups is I think the best way to learn about how to use these tools and to think about prompting is to play with them. So if one person in the group could log into Poe, if you didn't do that last night, then I'd like you to work together. That person can screen share. You're going to click on create bot. Think about a bot that you might use in your teaching context or just something for fun. I made my kids a a Roblox Adopt Me bot. If you played Roblox, it's a particular game that assess the value of different animals. So you can have fun with this as well. Give your bot a title, scroll down, decide your base bot. Keep in mind that the base bot should be a free version. So you're not using your paid version. Spend a little bit of time. Think about those best practices for a pump prompt, create a prompt. Let's not do knowledge base this time. Let's focus on prompting the tool, add a greeting message, add a bio for your bot, and then create it. After you've created it, I'll get you to grab that link. And after you do the activity, let's have you share out a little bit what you've done. Thanks, Lucas. Yes. So, uh, before everybody, everybody leaves, we just have a, a few questions on, on the Padlet. I'm just going to put the link in the chat so then you can all contribute. So basically, we have three questions for, for that particular activity. Uh, now that you have a better understanding of what the chatbots are, um, you've been able to explore um, you know, what works well, what doesn't work really, and how you could potentially use them in your teaching. Uh, so the first question is, why are you using Gen AI agents or custom chatbots? How could you use them uh, in teaching and learning and what challenges do you already foresee? So Andrew, you mentioned, you mentioned already a potential uh, issue with the fact that it doesn't save the data, having that sort of amnesia. Um, and I can see already people contributing, but you click the plus button to uh, under each column and then you can just uh, provide an answer. And if anybody wants to share, I know we have a two minutes left, uh, but more than happy to have anybody and mute themselves and just uh, talk about what they just shared. But for those already contributing, thank you so much. You know, as everyone starts, completes filling that Padlet, um, we will share back the slides, the recording for the session, as well as the worksheet with you. I've also saved the chat, so I'll share back some of those chat bots. And I want to thank everyone for joining the session. I hope you had some fun playing with Poe and we managed to get through our technical difficulties at the beginning. So thanks so much for joining.